And hi, everyone. Welcome to Collection Spotlight with the Co Center for the Arts and First American Art Magazine. This is our 13th um, Collection Spotlight. It's very exciting. I'm Bess Murphy. I'm the curator at the Co Center. And um, I am so pleased to be here in person at the Co today with the pieces that we're going to be talking about with our guest artist. Um, I will be working with the pieces, handling them. Um, I will have my hands on the pieces. My hands are clean, dry, but generally speaking, we don't work with gloves at the Co for the majority of our collection. And we just believe that that's one of the ways that we set our intention about respecting and honoring the pieces, but we also feel like we can more carefully handle the pieces without sort of the intermediary of, of gloves in between us and the pieces. So I'm going to pass it over to Rachel, who will do a very brief introduction of the co, and I will speak with you all soon. Hi, I'm Rachel Wixom, and I'm the executive director and president at the Co Center. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about the Co. We're about creating awareness and education and appreciation of Indigenous arts. Uh, we connect people and the arts uh, through inclusive hands-on experiential learning and partnering. And we steward responsibly, hopefully, um, an amazing collection that's diverse and eclectic. Uh, and some of that you'll see today, of course. So um, I want to thank America so very much. It's been about a year since we started this program. We're in our 13th um, event or experience. And so this is really terrific. And I also want to thank uh, very much Ian for um, hosting today. And of course, Bess, who's been uh, involved and in, um, helping and making it happen as well. So thank you so much. And there you go. America, take it over. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all for joining us on this Tuesday afternoon. Um, this is a co-production of the Co, the Ralph T. Co Center of Arts out in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and um, First American Art Magazine here in Norman, Oklahoma. So First American Art Magazine is a quarterly print and um, digital journal um, covering art of the Americas. So today we're getting a little off track um, for us outside our purview, but it's really exciting because we're gonna look at the Polynesian and Oceanic collections of the Co, which um, when things open up more, um, there's so much to explore and you can actually visit these collections in person in Santa Fe by making an appointment. Um, Ian, um, I'm really honored to have Ian Kualii um, <laughs> say it. Kualii. Thank you. Kuali. Kuali. And um, yeah, I met him when he was still a student at IAI. He's an incredible drafts person, but he's moved in many different directions now. Um, he's a multidisciplinary artist of native Hawaiian ancestry and Apache ancestry. His career spans more than two decades and he's working, he's now making murals, working large scale paper cuts, which I hope he'll be able to share some of those with us. Also prints and now site specific installations. So Ian, thank you so much for being here and Take it away. Thank you, America. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, we we um, we met when I was doing my uh, National Endowment for the Arts artist residency at uh, I, I actually was never a student, and Kenneth oh, is on here. Kenneth is number two, yeah, but it's okay. Um, I actually have no uh, formal art training, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> but yeah, I know, right? Uh, no, 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 no bachelor's, no, no MFA. But um, anyway. Aloha kako, uh, greetings everyone. My name is Ian Joseph Kekoa Hardwick Kuali'i or just Ian Kuali'i for short. Um, I am a mixed media or multidisciplinary artist, uh, primarily focusing in hand cut paper, which I could show you shortly. Um, I'm currently a uh, an blessed individual to, to like live here in Santa Fe, New Mexico or Obokoge, which is the ancestral homeland of the Tewa people um, and the Apache. Um, and currently transmitting live from my tiny at home studio. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I'm excited to do this collection uh, spotlight. Um, today we'll be focusing on, I pulled a couple extra items. Um, well, actually one extra item, I was gonna pull two, but I pulled, um, a kava bowl from Fiji, which is uh, we can talk about as well, because I have a kava bowl here, which I use for 
my personal drinking. Um, anyway, yeah, so let's give you, I guess, a little look at maybe an example of some of the work that I do as a contemporary Kanaka Maoli Native Hawaiian artist. Um, this is sort of my little garage at home studio space. But I um, recently completed this six foot by four foot um, portrait of our final monarch, Queen Liliuokalani, for the National Portrait Gallery competition. Um, it's six foot by four feet. You can kind of like see, you can like. Can you explain? That's a paper cut, right? What the? It's or all paper. Print? Yeah, it's all it's all paper cut. So oh it's God. all extractive, right? So solid sheet of paper. Um, I paint the verso of it, so it creates this like slight illuminated effect, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of hard to make out currently. Um, but yeah, all of these little lines that make out the detail are actually cut with this just standard number 11 X-Acto blade. Wow. Um, and then, uh, yeah, extracted uh, to create the portrait. Um, and this is like, yeah, this, this one's great. Like I went through and actually incorporated a small portion of the Queen's Prayer, which was a, um, a melee she composed while she was imprisoned um, in the palace, Iolani Palace in Olala Hawaii in the Hawaiian language. So I wanted to sort of embed a little bit of, of that history uh, to give the piece a bit more power um, and meaning. But yeah, you could see like scraps from like previous commissions and whatnot that I haven't cleaned up yet. You know, well, those, those want to be a collage. I know, right? So bad. Um, but yeah, welcome to the dirty dungeon, as I call it. Um, and I'm excited to, uh, excited to, excited to present these works. If I can plug in the computer, never mind. Anyway, uh, Bess, uh, you yeah. want to start with maybe, let's start with the, the Kava Bowl, actually. Okay, we could talk see. about moving, right, we could talk about moving from, uh, ooh, so Hello. maybe, let's see if everyone can see this. Um, so right. we have this as being, you know, a um, early 20th century piece. Right. Does we it have any, have it doesn't have any inlay in the rim, right? No inlay in the rim. Okay. Right. And so um, in Hawaii, um, kava is actually called ava, and we cultivated multiple different species of it. Um, and it, certain ones are used for so, just social drinking currently. Um, other ones are used for specifically for ceremony. Um, culturally, there are certain rare um, ava that were designated specifically for the chiefly line and the, the priestly line. Um, and specifically used only during ceremony. Um, and I, I love the Fijian, um, I mean, the, it all came through the Western portion of the Pacific, further out East through the canoe journeys, which we'll talk about with some of the other items. Um, but kava was actually one of the canoe plants that traveled from the Western portions of the Pacific to the East. Um, and here's like an example of my, um, my ava bowl. So you could see like the, the difference in design and, and shape, you know? Um, this is more, yeah. Yeah, this one was gifted to me by my partner. Um, it even has my like coconut drinking cups inside of it um, and little other sort of modern strainers. But these, this would be used for like more social drinking. Um, and uh, interesting thing about like ava or kava as well. Um, it's great for when um, an individual is dealing with um, addiction. So um, if somebody you know is trying to, uh, you know, quit drinking, ABBA is like a great, or kava is a great sort of um, in-between beverage to sort of help them uh, remove alcohol from, or any other type of substance from, um, from their life, which is great. But um, yeah, and no, I'm super, uh, it's, you know, a kava was a, a canoe plant. So we can go like directly into like some of the other conversations that we have. I love the fact that they use legs um, on 
on their bowls. Um, yeah. Actually, I, there's, I've seen ones that are massive, um, like probably six, six feet in diameter, you know, mm -hmm. like massive, massive um, ava bowls for, for ceremony. But you never speak, um, you never speak ill around the kava or the ava. Um, I was always told you never turn your back to the ava. Um, ava, um, the gods Kane and Kanaloa are always present um, when ava is present. Um, they were also great, or like, you know, they love to drink ava themselves. So um, it plays a huge important role in, in our cultural practices and, and ceremonies. Um, but yeah, we can, I guess, move on to maybe can some I of the other really quickly, cool... like, Do you think it's yeah. intentional how that looks like an animal face? Are there- I, I do, I do. Um, I, I think that, um, I'm not exactly sure why, but I've seen that, um, because I could speak more to um, like the fact that it came from, the practice came from that portion of the Pacific through to Hawaii. Um, but I'm guessing that it probably represents some sort of deity or animal being present as well. So like a lot of our um, more ceremonial bowls in Hawaii would have ki'i carved or like, you know, what you would call tiki, you know, in some tr traditions or like what most people would know. Um, like there would be Kane and Kanaloa usually would be holding the bowl itself. And so, yeah, I'm guessing that it's probably like a similar, similar sort of thing where either a revered animal or a revered deity or a combination of the two, because, you know, often, you know, our deities also took the form of, of an, certain animals or plant life. Interesting. Yeah, and we don't have an incredible amount of information in our database on this piece, so I can't speak any more to that. It's not my area of expertise by any means, but I think, America, you're absolutely right. This is clearly an animal. Right. I'm wondering if it's actually, like, closer to, like, pig pig imagery, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think the only I, thing... I, I, go sorry, ahead, go sorry. Ahead. No, I was just gonna, the only thing that we have noted is that, um, and I don't, I'm don't know about the accuracy of this necessarily, but that typically, um, the kava bowls from Fiji have only four legs, whereas this one has six. Right. Um, and so the, we have a note about how that possibly shows an influence, um, a Samoan or Tongan influence. So, so I was going to say Samoan, most likely, because. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because uh, my partner and I were talking about um, about a kava bowl that they have at their house on the reservation in uh, Sumala, Sumala uh, Shumash territory, and it was gifted to them by uh, one of their, their in-laws. Like I think it was like the uncle of the person who married into their family, who's Samoan. And it was funny the first time I went to the reservation, I actually looked, and they were using it as a storage bowl. And I'm like, hmm, like you know, what are you doing with that? So immediately, I could identify that it was Samoan, right? I was like, what are you doing with that, like, you know, someone probable, you know, and, you know, I get the whole story and whatnot. But yeah, um, I wasn't, I, I didn't know that the Fijian um, had typically only four legs, which is. Again, I, um, will, I, that is what we have. I right, have right, not right. done further research on it, <laughs> but um, that is, yeah. I definitely so need to do. One, yeah. Yeah. More, a bit more research on, on, um, certain pattern because that's the other thing as well as I've noticed that um, a lot of the Samoan and Tongan kava bowls tend to have super ornate inlay around the rims you know and uh, pattern work incorporated into the rim and so um, I'm guessing if that also has to do with containing certain types of energy and combating other sorts of other because you know again you're not supposed to speak ill or bring ill intention around the kaba or the aba during ceremony. Um, uh, in Hawaii too, like you'll see too, like in, in kaba and in aba uh, kaba ceremonies in particular, that there's usually clapping that takes place during the ceremony. Like we, uh, to my knowledge, we didn't we didn't do that in Hawaii. You know, so there's like sort of these weirds. Uh, even though we're all genetically, you know, like genetic relatives throughout the, that portion of the Pacific. Um, there are those cultural things that have switched up and became unique to, you know, certain, like certain island um, 
certain island chains or, or what have you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, do you want to do we want to move on to like maybe some of the other bulls that are represented that are closer yeah. to maybe yeah, so that way we can get an idea as well. Maybe the um, the one that has the damage on the in, inside portion. Yeah, sure. Because I, it's it's pretty similar in in um, shape, I believe, to my ava bowl, which is yeah, and probably right. sort of similar in scale. I'm like, let's see, this might be kind slightly. Of. I mean, yeah, that one looks like it's um, a bit deeper. Hold it next time. Right. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. I got a tiny head, so you can't really make out the doesn't mean anything. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, to me, the interesting thing about this piece is like obviously the repairs, right? Um, I forget exactly what date they were, what date were they attributing that one to? We have it um, as mid 19th century. Okay. And it, and it says that it was um, like as far as the wood, right? Correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. And so like what I'm looking at immediately is um, like the repair portions, right? And I'm not sure if like the wood is actually the same exact wood in repair. And it's obviously they used like metal, metal nails, correct? These are, okay. sorry, they're actually wood. Are they wood? Okay, good. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. So, like I was, um, I was actually taking a look at, I have this amazing book um, here and mm -hmm. it, it talks about like uh, even cordage that was used in repairing uh, certain types of bowls. So you would use like a uh, coconut cordage as well. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the, the most interesting, like the thing that interests me the most about this piece um, was the inside. Um, so if you wanted to show the inside and maybe like the-, the There's another repair on the other side. And right. so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll switch around to that after we look at the inside. And so there, I was talking earlier with my partner about, about this bowl and I'm, and I'm guessing that that damage was created because of food that was stored in it. Um, and there was also a practice where um, when, a, when a loved one died, often if there was like a cave burial or something, they would leave uh, their beloved possessions in the cave with the individual. And sometimes they would also leave food with them so their spirit wouldn't leave and go back to the home. And so like, I'm wondering actually if this was a vessel that was found at some point that had food that was left behind and would have created that sort of damage on the inside. And also the fact that it's, actu it's actually a cracked bowl, um, you know, because it wasn't like super, I mean, it may have just been left behind, so it wasn't right. So it wasn't fully taken care of. And then when it was found, it may have been, those may have been the repairs that were made to it. Um, yeah, we have like an interesting practice with that as well. So, you know, they were used for, for food, they were used for food scraps. Um, they were also used for other types of storage. In some cases, um, in our burial practice with um, our ED, with our bones, which are revered more than like any other portion of our body, um, especially in death, because they were the only things that were technically left behind. Um, loved ones at times, we had this like burial practice where like certain individuals would take the bones of the like uh, kahu, like the kahuna um, or the ali'i, like the chiefs, and they would take them to areas and they would be the only ones that knew. But then like a family member might like kind of gather some pieces of information of where the bones might have been kept. And in some cases they would go back and it's like, um, they speak about it a little bit in this book by um, our historian, um, Mary Kavana Pukui. Um, but basically, a um, yeah, little, little look here. But um, in some cases, the loved one, because they missed the individual, would go back to the cave and grab certain items. And uh, in some cases, actually the EV, like the bones themselves. So like it would be like a forearm and a femur and maybe even the skull. And then they would store them in, in some cases, bigger bowls like calabashes and stuff and hide them. And in some cases they would even store the bones inside their pillows while they slept. So they still slept with their loved one. Um, and so it got me thinking about, about this piece. Um, 
because of that that damage on the inside from insects it it looks like it might have been caused by some sort of food that was left in the bowl that made it more susceptible like maybe something acidic or something corroded acidic or even or even just attracting insects to because of food that was decaying within the bowl you know? part of my understanding of of the wood is that it is particularly uh it is a good repellent for insect activity, right? Because it, it has natural sort of insect repellent. It, it's, and because it's also endemic to that, that wood itself is endemic to right. Hawaii. So, you right. know, it, like the, the pests that were there, like wouldn't, you know, it would have to be something that was, you know, brought to the island at a certain point in order for it to cause that, or it had to be something. And it appears like, because it's the way it's resting at the bottom, it's not, it's not eating at the rest of the, at the bowl, you know, it's, it's eating at a certain portion. And so it makes me feel like there was something that was left in there that was being consumed by insects that decided to travel in there. And that's what I mean, the discussion on the chat, just really quickly, sorry. Um, right. Can you confirm that um, these repairs would have been indigenous or were they made by another group later on? Um, that's tough to actually tell because, oh, okay. you know, like, yeah, because we also had like, you have a large Japanese population, you know, so like Japanese joinery and like woodwork, you know, um, so it could have like taken place a little bit further um, down the line. I mean, it could be of, you know, Kanaka Maoli, like native Hawaiian hands that did the repairs. Um, but yeah, that, it's super, it's super tough to, to say with that one. Um, yeah. The other one, if you want to actually grab the other bowl and, um, because th these repairs look like they they are a bit more like typical like leaning into sort of I guess what we consider like traditional repairing of the works so yeah I love this I love that piece I mean it's um, I can pull up like yeah and this one is interesting too because you had it listed as ko'u as well right hardwood that's yes I'm like let me make sure yes we do and um that could have just been an interpretation or a guess or right. optimism. <laughs> right, because to me, it looks like that maybe some of the repair work is actually either um, repaired with koa or, or milo. And I'll okay, show you like I an know. example. Of, right, this is an example of a smaller one that I have that's pretty similar to that one, right? Mm -hmm. And I use this one um, uh, for storing my, my shell, like one of my shell lays, you know, my kupe ele. So it's like, um, we still very much, we still very much use these, you know what I mean? These aren't like something that just sits on the shelves unless it's like, I, I heard Tony Abeda again, like we had this conversation before. I heard Tony Abeda has an amazing collection of them and I would love to see them one day, but you know, I, I, I use mine still, you know, um, they're gifted to me. This one's Milo. Um, and so you can see a lot of similar color and, and kind of grain within it, you know, but if you look at the repair work, like especially the, um, butterfly repair work you know that that looks like it's a totally different wood and the actual big chunk that was re, uh, put in there to replace it that that appears to be a different wood as well and so i'm guessing it's either like the lighter portion of um milo because we have um or or koa because i have another example of a bowl here which is a lighter milo you know um this one has a lid as well um, you know, so if you can look, you look at the um, different types of grain uh, um, of the wood and then the coloration as well. But yeah, um, America, these, this would be more of like a, um, an expected sort of repair technique for, okay. for, for our la'au, for, for like our wood and stuff, you know. And then um, the they're referring to it as butterfly repairs? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like a, a butterfly technique, right? Um, out, some people consider it like an hourglass technique, I think, as well, or whatever. But you know, I think it just has to do with like the basic shape. It it just creates like a, a lock notch, right, for the for the wood itself to like sit in. Um, and it's pretty common as well amongst like other other individuals that do um, around the globe that do repair work, uh, work as well. So you find it within like again like Japanese repair work, um, you know, and other other cultures too throughout um, throughout the Pacific. But I, yeah, I use this one. This one's great because it has a lid um, and it stores my, like one of my, like my feather lay, 
you know. So beautiful. Right. And so, um, yeah, it helps protect it from any kind of like mites, you know, or other critters from getting in, um, which is great because currently I'm dealing with like a small, <laughs> small little gnat infestation that decided that it was warm enough inside of our, um, our house during the winter to like nest out. But right. So um, I love that piece. I love that piece a lot. Um, I have a question for you though. Um, as far as the, as far as the sheen on it, mm -hmm. um, does it look like they used any kind of lacquer Lacking. to sheen? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's a really good question. I, I don't, now it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. It does to me, let me see if you can get in here. So there is a little bit, so you see some of the cracks where the uh, repairs were made. To me, it right. looks like there's something that could be slightly glossed, could be seen as slightly glossed over the cracks. We mm -hmm. haven't done any sort of full um, conservation assessments of these pieces at all. So was this one um, was attributed to um, to the Blackburn uh, that, collection? Or was that the that's other one? The other no, that's this one. This one is related right. to the Blackburn, possibly. Okay. So, right. um, what we have listed for the provenance is that actually Ted Co might have purchased this piece when in Hawaii himself, and that it was possibly part of the Blackburn collection. Right. Okay. So was this this was the one that was from that was possibly purchased in. Mm -hmm. I may I like in Kamuela, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I would love to do like further research on that piece when you're open again. That. Yeah, um, absolutely. I'm going to take a look at it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I may and even be able to, I think we had this conversation briefly, but I may even be able to, if it is from that area, um, the Hawaiian homestead is right there. And I'm guessing that, you know, we could probably find uh, the family family that made that, you know? That'd be incredible. Um, the only other thought that I have in terms of any sort of treatment or anything is that there is, and this is going to be really hard to see, there's definitely a little portion inside of this interior crack that where you can see residue of some sort of glue or adhesive or okay. sealant. Yeah, so they, yeah, they, they probably, the middle. Right. Yeah. yeah, they probably use some sort of lacquer on it because that was one of the other things like, um, if you examine the sheen on this one, this is like completely, this is completely natural. And what we, what I use, I mean, a lot of people use a, various other types of oils, but I use like kukui nut oil, you know what I mean? Which is another, you know, plant that we use in medicine and, and other things. We, it's candle nut essentially. Mm -hmm. um, we would use it for creating our torches, but um, like you, I use this, you know, just a little bit of this on, on the wood and it's, it's good. It's perfect. Um, oh yeah. What type of oil? Yeah. Kukui, kukui nut oil. So it's basically, um, yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, it's candle nut. Um, <laughs> we also, uh, this old Portuguese man back in the island of Maui um, referred to kukui nut oil as ass bandit oil <laughs> because apparently oh, the yeah. sap, Apparently the sap from kukui nut oil is a natural laxative as well. And so um, a lot of the elders, um, when they would like, in particular, this older Portuguese gentleman, um, when he wanted to play a pr practical joke on his friends, he would like bake cookies with a little bit of kukui nut and they would immediately have to go use the restroom. You know, <laughs> it's like, I think it but anyway, culturally, um, well, you could use all sorts of things uh, for this. Like some people use a combination of like macadamia nut oil, um, kukui nut oil with a little, little bit of beeswax. I just use outright kukui nut oil. Yes, that, also, also, known as, also known as candle nut. I think that brings up sort of an interesting point for me in thinking about this collection. I mean, this collection was a private collection for a long time, but right. um, obviously is now a public collection. And just in terms of how um, private collectors or institutions care for pieces like this in their collection as well. You know, like mm -hmm. these, we do not do anything like that. And perhaps some of the additional cracking, I think particularly on the larger bowl is probably because of the climate that this piece has been living in for so long. I mean, it was in 
most That's definitely. Right. Exactly. It's so dry mm -hmm. here. And so it's interesting to think about like, would that be, would a museum conservator incorporate or will they, as we continue on, incorporate using kukui nut oil on their pieces and how often? And I think that's so exciting and interesting to think about what what that opens up. Right. Um, the one of the other things I wanted to kind of touch on as well, um, because we were we we're talking about um, like you know uh, canoe plants, things of that nature. So obvious, obviously, us being great voyagers of of open ocean. Um, you know, we relied heavily on, on these vessels, you know, or vessels of this sort, you know, um, you probably wouldn't find so much like these, you know, um, on a canoe, unless it was like very prized, you know, you would typically find the ones that were made out of gourd, like the ones that are uh, ipu, like uh, bowls and storage, uh, storage containers. But they would be pretty similar in, in um, you know, with as far as like the lids and everything were concerned. And they would be used to like store, you know, um, like here, here's, again, we can go back to the cordage um, book here, you know, like they would have, they would have been stored in nets like this to make sure because, you know, they were um, like our ancestors spent like weeks just creating like maybe a single fish hook you know what I mean so you couldn't lose that fish hook like that fish, that fish hook was like your 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 livelihood right it was your so you would store them in things like this and typically these nets like would stick on the individual you know and because you um because you had it in a net and because it was like the ipu the ipu was um the gourd was pretty much like water resistant it acted as a flotation device too. You know what I mean? So if it like went overboard on a vessel, it would be a bit easier for you to get to it. You know, where maybe something like this because of it being a bit heavier may have sunk, you know, in, in the ocean would have become like waterlogged or whatever, you know? Um, so yeah, no, super important when, you know, we, we talk about like, like the, uh, uh, the canoes and, um, and our people and what we brought with us and, and the ingenuity and innovation that we had to, you know, cause again, like- Just because, I thought it would be- Sorry? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess somebody unmuted. Um, but, um, you know, it's, you know, we had to, again, like these are like kind of common, uh, common items that, you know, we lived with and we used on a regular basis. Um, and then they, they slightly altered, you know, through innovation as it, for, it went further east, you know. Um, and that's probably due to, like, you know, the idea of, of, of open ocean voyage, right? Like, you had to, like, adapt certain things, um, too. Um, and so now, like, going into the idea of um, open ocean voyage, we can just go ahead and start talking about the, um, the stick maps, actually. Do you want to go to your um, PowerPoint first? Sure, we can do that. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's coming in. Start. So, what do you call these first? You know, honestly, like I don't know the name that the our Micronesian relatives would call them directly. But is is that okay? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, for me, like, that's bad on me to, like, not, you know, and to actually be speaking on them. Um, but for me, they're super important when it comes to um, what's currently happening, you know, what's, what's currently happening with this massive reawakening of, uh, of, our, of our relatives throughout the Pacific, sort of reclaiming our, our canoe traditions our tradition, uh, traditional methods of um, wayfinding in general, whether it be through, um, you know, understanding like the stars and the constellations, so which directions you're heading. Um, these maps um, in particular, like the, you know, they're, they, they're typically made from palm fronds. I believe that this one says rattan, um, cowrie shells and uh, coconut fibers to tie it all together, but the sticks like represent uh, different currents and, and the shells themselves represent 
different islands. So you know exactly which currents are, you know, you're going to run into or which ones that you, you can take to like, you know, I guess, expedite your, your pathway. Um, and then there's also certain cross ones that, that um, hit at certain points that are a bit more wavy that show maybe other things such as um, uh, wave patterns, you know what I mean? Maybe even like sandbars or certain reefs. So yeah, you see those ones that are kind of like a bit more in the center, they would probably represent, um, you know, like certain things that you needed to watch out for when your, your canoe was, um, was passing in that direction if you were heading directly to that island. Um, and a lot of the islands too, like in, um, in Micronesia, they're smaller islands, you know, so they rely on these heavily in order for them to travel from island to island to gather certain types of food or even fishing. Um, but yeah, I mean, completely, completely brilliant, you know. Um, would these be on the boat with them or would they leave them behind? Was it memorized? It's my, it's my understanding that they would actually just memorize them. So they were used as devices, as tools on land to actually um, show individuals. And it, it, most of it was, was memorized, you know? Um, even um, we can go to, if we go to the slideshow, um, we could talk about uh, Po Navigator Mao Piolo. And he, you know, he was instrumental in, um, in, in helping us like native Hawaiians uh, like reclaim our tradition of, of traditional wayfinding. And here you see him, you know, with like a small like map made out of like little pieces of white coral and strings that would show you exactly like what directions like certain stars were, you know what I mean? So if you wanted to head a certain direction, you, you navigate by this star. Um, and there's, it's funny too, because, you know, like with, um, uh, with movies like, uh, Moana, you know, that, that came out with Disney, um, you start seeing like this iconic, um, thing that happens where like people will use their hand in like a shape of an L to kind of like navigate. And people think that that was actually a traditional like thing that we did in the South Pacific, but this is actually something that is recent. So if you see somebody like doing this or talking about this is like something that was used like back in ancient times for, for navigating by the stars and for, from the horizon, uh, it's, it's just not true. It was actually something that was created recently on, on the Hokulea, um, which, yeah, we could talk about. So um, Mao uh, Pialog was the individual Po navigator, master navigator from Micronesia, from Sarawa, who uh, brought basically the traditional wayfinding back to the, like our people in Hawaii through the Polynesian Voyaging Society and the Hokulea. And if you go to the next photo um, to Sam Ka'ai, Sam Ka'ai was my mother's mentor. Um, he is a master wood carver in Hawaii and um, like basically just a wealth of, of Hawaiian traditional knowledge. And, um, you know, he's still alive. He teaches, teaches people um, to this day. Um, but he was the one that actually carved the first, the, the two ki'i that you find on our, our, um, our canoe, our va'a hokulea, the one that just sailed around the globe using only traditional, you know, wayfinding methods. Um, and, uh, and so he was part of a, uh, the group of individuals, I believe was the second or third voyage to Tahiti or second voyage to Tahiti. But he was he did the the key on on the the front end tail of the vessel itself, uh, one for looking forward, and then um, I forget what the other symbolism was for the other. Um, but Mao actually gifted him, and you can go to the next slide that shows um, he gifted him these from that voyage, um, and these were these belonged to Mao, were gifted to Sam, and then Sam gifted them to my mother. And then my mother gifted them to me. So I actually have these in my collection. They're currently in, in my storage facility in, in California and I need to get them out because um, they need to be with me. But I just love that like, if you take a look at the one that Bess is holding up and then you go to the next slide, which is the bigger one, you can kind of see a similarity to like how even, you know, like how it's all gridded out 
within like, you know, a, qu a certain quadrant of like islands. Um, and then I believe like, um, I mean, it doesn't really matter which direction you're looking at it because it, it, it all matters what direction you're sailing towards, correct? So it doesn't matter if this is like north or south or whatever. Um, but uh, can, you, um, can you pull yours out uh, maybe a bit more best? Because I want to see if there's any like kind of like areas that are kind of, uh, yeah, so like that the bottom corner of yours looks pretty similar to the bottom corner of the one that's on the slide. Uh, get a different handle on it. <laughs> right. Does it like, weigh a lot? No, it's really light, but oh, I just, you know, I just don't want, right. I don't want it to flop over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, super, they're super light, but, um, you know, because they're only held together by um, yeah. small pieces of, of um, cordage, like they're, you know, they could slide out relatively easy. Um, <laughs> but it's like, if you look at like the one that Bess is holding up, you see like this, this sort of shape here. So it looks like that the, those islands there would have had probably a big reef system. You so know like what I mean? Right that here? Totally, yeah. So you know what I mean? So like, like looking at, at shapes like that, you kind of like uh, get an idea, you know, of, of again, like the knowledge of knowing and observing, uh, you know, your currents and, and placement of island and even things that are underneath the water, such as reefs or sandbars, you know? Um, so in my total that. ignorance this entire time, I've just sort of thought like, oh, this looks like such a, this is a, a boat shape, obviously. But, and I've always been like, that can't be accurate because like, why would the boat be on there? Because that's not a permanent thing. So thank right. you for pointing of out course. to well, me definitely. my ignorance and I'm just owning that publicly in front of everyone on this Zoom. The importance but, of having these collection spotlights. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Ian, Ian, I have a question for you. Yes. So how, what's the square mileage that these can represent? Can they go from very small to very large areas? Um, well, yeah, I'm not sure exactly as far as square mileage. I mean, you could probably figure out if this, like what, what area of Micronesia this is just based on the placement of the shells, mm. you know, and then like with modern te technology kind of like gauging between each island, what it what it would be as far as like you know square mileage. But could it be like hundreds of miles between hundreds, islands? Hundreds, yeah, it could be hundreds of miles between islands. So it takes a yeah. really creative mind to be able to paint a bird's view in one of these without having right. the ability to be a bird. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you know like so paired with this though, you know. Um, the the observation of stars, right? So observation of constellations. So you're already observing the heavens and you're observing it in this, the idea of this dome, right? Um, and then placement of stars according to this sort of like, you know, in your own, own mind, this kind of like dome perspective. And so you go back to that picture of Mao, like he has it gridded out in a circle because that would be the only way that you'd be able to like um, sort of lay out, you know, that, that idea of like what would actually be kind of like a dome and how the stars would pass over. So like certain lines that would, would cross over. So, you know, like maybe uh, a star like, um, like Makali'i or something, you know, like coming up during a certain season of the year. And that would mark exactly where, you know, the direction you would head to say during during that time of the season, you know, for that island on that map, you know what I mean? To go and, uh, and, and gather a certain type of fish that were known to be perfect to like, you know, harvest during that time, like gather during that time, you know what I mean? Fish during that time. Um, and so, yeah, it's all, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, a lot of this information too, um, is readily available. Like, so if anybody ever wanted to just, you know, uh, do further research on on wayfinding, because you could you could use these same methods here on, you know, the so-called continental continental United States through, you know, if you need if you wanted to like just test yourself one of these days with a group of individuals while you're camping out in I don't know some random area. Um, you can go to like the Polynesian Voyaging, uh, Voyaging Society and other, other places like NASA and cross-reference their, their star maps according to like certain hemisphere, you know? And so you'd be able to like basically do the same exact thing, you know? Um, 
which is beautiful as well because we also have a sister vessel that um, I forget the name of it offhand that sails alongside Hokulea these days, which is all completely like modern technology. So it, it uses like GPS tracking and everything else. So we have one vessel that does everything, you know, uh, our traditional our, our traditional way and then one that will pair it, you know? So you can, again, like the innovation of like cross-referencing the two, you know, and creating a stronger sort of understanding of these things, you know? Kenneth, man, I still, I see you there, man. I, I can't wait. I can't wait to like get over and have these conversations with you again and, you know, start working on, on this paddle, you know? Um, it's super, it's super important that we don't forget these things, you know, and that we, we continue to, to even dig deeper. I mean, there's still a lot, obviously, that I need to learn about these things. Um, but at, at least if you're, I guess, in a sense, sort of hungry for that knowledge, you know, um, you're going to get there. You know, yeah. and like I was saying before too, Kenneth, like, um, you know, um, even though from like the Muskogee, um, the Mus Muskogee lens, you know, and, um, and you talking about, you know, the, the fact that it's sleeping currently, if you're continuously putting it out there, you know, I said like, I, like one of these days, you know, your relatives are going to like find something it's gonna you're gonna end up digging up like a huge portion of an old canoe or something somewhere you know this yeah is the beautiful. george alexander piece it's the cypress right. canoe paddle right and you're a part of that dude and it's waking up on its own yep i mean it's just you know like we we want it you know what i mean we want it and so it'll, it'll happen you know and because uh the land knows it you know, our ancestors know it. So it, it, it'll be, you know, um, we just have to prove to them that, that we want, we, we want those things back. That's it. You know, it's the same thing with like our tattoo, tr our tattoo traditions, right? Like so many, so many different nations have, um, it's just dormant currently, you know? Um, but I, I see countless individuals, you know, out there seeking, and in that seeking, you know, it's it's reawakening and it's reawakening strong, you know. The well, dream I didn't know that reality that they've always wanted. You know, I didn't know I was going to find a uh, a willing partner in you until we <laughs> cross paths and start talking canoes and canoe paddles. And you know, part of your uh, presentation today, man, that, that's great because you know, what's the personal uh, take on our own paths do we have our own maps you know mm -hmm. some call it the five-year plan the 10-year plan and uh you know no man we're like we're lifers in this. <laughs> yeah. yeah you know it's it's there, there is no five ten year 20 year plan it's it's something that that you know it's it's always and we're always going to be learning and we're always going to be um you know, uh, for lack of a better term, like just redis rediscovering things about ourselves and as like individual peoples, you know, um, and then also incorporating again, like new methodologies, you know, um, with, with these contemporary times, right? Um, that like help preserve and also reinforce those traditions, you know, um, that's- well, I, I like the I'm analogy with your maps because we know where the currents are, right? And if, yeah, yeah, in our personal lives, you know where the currents are and what, what it's going to take you and what's going to, you're working against. Right. You know, like, it, it, in, like, I hear a lot of, um, like, our elders in Hawaii talk about, um, like, us Kanaka, right? Like, us, us Native Hawaiians. Um, like, we're one people. It's one vessel and we all move together in the same direction, right? Regardless of, like, which currents are bombarding or hitting like hitting our va'a right like our our life like we all go in together and we all we all sail in the same direction right I like um, it. yeah so you know what I mean it's like like any kind of like I guess like um older older sort of analogy for for life and and currents and you know the 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 main the main va'a the main the main canoe 
which is our planet, you know, and caring for it. And in return, caring for the planet, caring for, we're caring for ourselves and we're caring for the rest of our relatives, right? And so, um, yeah, man, like me, me going into uh, this seeking is also me seeking to help reinforce and help your people. You know what I mean? Like we, we don't, we don't deviate from that. You know what I mean? We try to share as much knowledge amongst each other as possible. We might not always agree on things, but, and we may have like different, different things culturally that, you know, like don't sort of mesh, but there are like bits and gems that we can share amongst each other to help solidify and reawaken, reawaken these things that have been sleeping for so long. You know, I spoke um, to a, uh, a medicine person at, up in uh, the Skagit, upper Skagit reservation mm -hmm. in uh, part of the uh, travel, the journey to Nisqually canoe journey. And mm -hmm. one of the things they asked me is what waters are you from? And I didn't understand what she was asking, but she said, what water are you connected to? And I said, well, we're river people, but what water are you connected to? And she wanted to know that we were connected to the Gulf of Mexico. And then right. the, there's the Pacific and there's these different, uh, I guess they're entities, you know, mm -hmm. and she wanted to know who we were, who we were connected through. No. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, because we also have like our own individual deities that represent those bodies of water, right? And those bodies of water ultimately make up who we are as a people as well, right? So I like, take, for instance, like in, um, in our culture, in, in, Hawaii, in Hawaii, um, like our word for wealth is vai vai, which basically just means water, water. It means richness, you know, and that's our fresh water. You know what I mean? And, and our fresh water, we, you know, viola, like water, water of life, you know what I mean? Like fresh water, the fresh waters that give life. Um, and so, yeah, it's the same thing, you know, like we, we talk about um, uh, if you're from different moku or different, different sections of different islands, different moku, um, and even the ili within those certain moku um, or districts of islands, um, they talk about, we talk about like, you know, uh, what, what, what mountain are you from? You know what I mean? Or are you, is your people from like a certain valley with a certain, certain stream runs through? You know what I mean? Because we dealt with the, the, those ideas of place markers, but also those are the things that um, nurture us, you know what I mean? And give us nourishment and give us life. Hence the term vai vai is like wealth or rich, richness, right? Being, being rich, you were rich, rich of water, you know, we're again being made up of water right richness of water so you know what waters are you from like makes total sense to me you know yeah yeah new to me i just, <laughs> I just want to let everybody else know that um we're getting close to the end but if you have other questions i think if everybody's okay with it you can unmute and just ask questions or if you don't want to talk you can just type them into the chat um because i bet there's some other questions out there for ian as well, or or for Kenneth, or any of us. <laughs> <laughs> for, for everybody. For everybody. Uh, well, has any questions for anybody? No. <laughs> any questions? I don't have a question, but I want to apologize. I tried to get on earlier, and I think some of you saw me, and then I got booted, so I was only able to make it at the very end. Hi. And I feel very bad about that. Sorry. Also, I wasn't trying to like unmute myself. It just kept telling me that. So I wasn't trying to be rude. So sorry. That's okay. Can I ask it's, it's, you? It's, you tough, it's tough in Idlewild, you know? It's you tough. You directed this incredible native um, um, tattooing um, symposium that was during Indian market. Would you ever consider doing something like that again, not during the busiest weekend of the entire I, year? So my mother, um, my mother's nonprofit organization, Kua Aina Associates, um, actually has been continuing that work. Cool. Um, but it's, but it's been um, primarily in California. Okay. Um, because of... Uh, there's such a huge um, uh, awakening of that tradition in California currently, um, in particular, just along along the so-called West Coast of uh, of the of the so-called United States in general. You know what I mean? So like all the way from uh, uh, I don't know, like Ahachiman territory, all the way up to like you know uh, where. Um, 
yeah i mean up to up to like as far as i know like uh the there's been a, yeah like the the clinket and the haida have like a, a huge um group of like they've been focusing a lot on bringing their their practices back is marjorie marjorie up in nome alaska you know what i mean like it's it's incredible like, so, as far north as you can get <laughs> yeah i know right like so i mean it's it's beautiful it's beautiful to to have the honor and privilege to experience that as well but yes i mean i would love to personally um uh figure out a way to make it like an annual thing in yes. um, in santa fe you know, and, and try to bring individuals that are, are, are not just uh, um, the tattooists themselves, but maybe people that, because like a lot of times too, it's like, um, I know that with our practice, you have to know how to make your own tools before you become um, a person who does the tattoo practice. But I know that's not necessarily the case with other individuals. And so there's, there's people that are sometimes like just tool makers and then the people that do the practice, right? Um, and I would love to like bring a bunch of people together to, to do that as well. Um, but it's my, my sacred mother is the one that, you know, handles all that now. I was just like the, I, I literally one day it was like during the, um, uh, the broken boxes podcast had an exhibition one year for Indian market at forming concept. And I literally like one day when I walked into the space, um, to meet up with Ginger Chinupa and I think it was Chip Thomas. Um, I literally like had this vision of like, it, it was like a literal vision. Like I could see the whole thing going down and, um, and it was us bringing a bunch of uh, indigenous tattoo artists to Santa Fe. And so I immediately like, like had the vision, spoke it directly out of my mouth to my mom and Ginger and they were like, we can make this happen. You know, and so it took, it took, I believe, like a, it was two years in the making, I believe, or something, something like that. But, you know, we, we, we worked through and, um, and, uh, and produced it. And unfortunately, like you're saying, it was during, <laughs> you know, and there was so many incredible awesome, things happening but... <laughs> for, for you. So like, you know, we got a great turnout, but like, you know, we, we definitely, and we were kind of further out because we were at um, at uh, SFAI, so it was like you had to trek out to 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 witness mm -hmm. it. Um, but it was great; it was incredible. You know, we. Um, but I, yeah, long, I mean, yes, I, I definitely want to do it again and make it an annual thing. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? <laughs> Did I even answer um, answer any questions? Did I just get bombarded? Yeah, there were a couple about the who who the repairs might have been by. And, mm -hmm. oh, okay. And um, you know, about recordings, which yes, the co is right. awesome, and they do record, make it available, and people right. are shouting out their appreciation to you in the chat. Awesome, thank you, everyone. I got um, a half a question, but uh, I'm not getting the full question. But use as part of a narrative oral tradition. So, I mean, I guess with the star charts or the charts, the current charts be used as part of the oral tradition but it seems like yeah yeah I mean most definitely I mean I, I always go into that space of like it was all oral tradition you know we didn't have a written language until contact and so yeah these things existed you know well before contact so yeah um and you know like um Oral traditions, man, like living languages, you know, <laughs> like like alive languages that are alive, opposed to, um, for lack, of, I mean, again, like I don't know, like to me, English is very much sort of a a dead language. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's like I don't know. It, why do you say, why do you say that? I'm curious. I don't know. I just to, what? For, for me, like I, I feel like there's just so much. Um, there's so much life in, in, in languages. I don't know. It's hard for me to, it's hard for me to say right now. I mean, that, it's like something that I'd have to like sit down and kind of, um, yeah. I mean, I don't know, like to is, me. Is a, a, a language alive um, because the words imbue such life or is a language alive because it evolves and changes or is it all of the above? 
what gives language life? Maybe that's- I think, it's, I think it's all of the above, but I think that there's also this thing of um, dominant languages, you know, I think is like the, that idea is like, if you have to be a dominant language, are you, is your language full of life or is your language full of domineering and death? You know what I mean? So it's, I don't know, it's like this, it's, it's hard for me to kind of like explain now, you know what I mean? I don't, uh, there's so much, to me, there's so much life in, in, our, in our language because it re, so much of it refers to um, like life and living objects. And obviously because we are, um, I mean, now we have written, written language, but um, you know, uh, we were, it, it, such an oral, oral tradition that, um, that you have no choice. It has no, it has to be a living language because it's an oral tradition. You know what I mean? It has to be alive. If it's not a, if it's not a living language, then like everything else dies with it, mm -hmm. you know, or, or sleeps, you know, a long sleep. What do you think of the future then of, of English considering it's so, I guess, stale? <laughs> well, I mean, for me, for me, the, the things that I consider the living portions of the English language are the individual slang yeah. that are born from the English language. To yeah. me, that's, that's living. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because again, yeah. it goes back to more of that. Um, it's not set in stone sort of. It's not confined you know, by rules. It's not it's, etched in stone. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, it's ever, it's ever like forever changing and forever changing with the life of individuals. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's um, to me, that's, that's living language, you know? And yeah, so. English is interesting. And also, you know, I speak German and a little French and, and you get these pockets uh, of, um, dialects around and to me that's really fascinating to um, experience that because um, it speaks to what you're saying in terms of a living language because you have these pockets where they develop and continue to grow and evolve new mm -hmm. terms and words and it's not stuck i mean yeah okay again we can go back to to like our voyaging you know uh -huh. and the fact that we dotted all the islands throughout the pacific right um, so many, so many of, uh, of us share essentially the same language, just small variations of things, right? So yeah. where, again, like Kava, right? There's yeah. Kava, but then there's Ava, you know what I mean? There's uh, Tiki, and then there's Ki'i, you know? There's like these weird small little variations between things. There's Aloha, and there's Aroha, right? There's like, so like, it doesn't matter, like you could be speaking some, you know, dialect from Aotearoa and our language is, we could pretty much kind of understand certain words and whole, whole phrases, you know, even though, because there's just these small slight variations between our language, just based on geography and like things that had to shift and evolved over time, right? So like essentially different, these dialects are just different. Slang. I think it's beautiful. I, I love that. It's so fascinating, you know, and like you learn a lot like, about each other through those differences. Right, yeah. like Tahiti, right? Like, like we would refer to Tahiti, even though like a majority of us can trace our ancestry from, well, a lot of us can trace our ancestry from those original voyages from Tahiti to Hawaii, right? And that's again, like I say Hawaii, I don't say Hawaii, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, there's like these weird sorts of things where W's are V's, you know, or whatever, like uh, uh, T's and K's are switched, you know? Um, but it's essentially the same language. Same language. And, it's a, it, and um, are you fluent in it or? And no, 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 no. <laughs> no, are you kidding me? Like, I wish I was fluent. I mean, but there's, again, there's also other things too. So um, Kumuhina, um, who is, a, is, is one of our Manamahu individuals who does work with like Oha, um, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and um, is a fluent fluent speaker. Mm -hmm. Also, there's like other dialects within Hawaiian speaking. So there's an older dialect from like Mihiao because they're an isolated island. Like you have to be like either, I think it's like you have to work for uh, the Department of Health um, or be 100% Hawaiian and have family connection in order for you to visit that island. <laughs> You know, oh, so they, they speak a yeah. totally different language. They, they speak a whole, like an older version of the Hawaiian language than modern Hawaiian. 
you know? And even if we want to get into like our more like pigeon, like Creole dialect of what was born from Hawaiian and like plantation languages, you know? Uh -huh. Like forget about it. That's, that's, completely, that's completely wild in itself where generational, like the pigeon that my mother spoke is like, you don't even hear any of that anymore. You know, it's, it's, it's altered, it's been altered so much through, through generations, you mm -hmm. know? There might be like little bits that, that survived, but it's not, it's, not, it's not the same as what's spoken now, you know? You may have individuals that like have like some great uncle or like, you know, elder that still speaks that, so they like pick fun at it or something, you mm -hmm. know? But it's not, it, yeah, it's, it's super interesting when you, when you start dissecting. It's fascinating. Stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's like, it's crazy too, because like, even, um, even our, um, even our uh, pigeon or Creole dialects of sorts, right? Like you get a lot of those throughout in like Samoa and Tonga, you know what I mean? Like you can go and hear people speaking pigeon Polynesian, you know, throughout the whole island chain of like different individuals and we could pick up on certain it's like, it's interesting as well, you know? Um, anyway, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, thank you for talking to that. I appreciate that. Of course, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't want to insult anybody by being like, English is a dead language when I'm speaking it, you know? <laughs> I'm well, trying to, I'm trying to speak make... about these things, like speaking life to like, through it through a dead language. I mean, that's kind of... That's well, it'd be interesting to, to go back as if you didn't speak it and then hear it for the first time. Because mm. when I speak to some people who um, are, don't speak English or are learning it, um, they, they, they're not very complimentary of how it sounds. <laughs> you know, right. yeah. it's, it's, definitely not, not, it's definitely not a love language. No, it's not sing definitely. song or melodic or, yeah. 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 And, I, and I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that because in, the English language ha has a lot of influence from German too, that yes. German is a love language. <laughs> and German can be actually quite, it's very guttural and harsh, but right. it, um, certain dialects are very sing-songy if you're getting um, over towards Italy or in those areas. And, and it's a lot of fun to speak. It's kind of like a puzzle. And, um, mm. you know, but um, yeah, it, I, yeah, language is just fascinating. Um, yeah, I, I, I apologize if I insulted anybody. <laughs> you know that's one thing about me is like if I, if I i'm not i'm not terrible when it comes to apologizing i'll own up to like if i've, if I've yeah I've, but it's I've, your opinion I, yeah i mean there's nothing wrong with that yeah but thank you I, I do appreciate it i'd love to talk more about that kind of stuff at some point um, of course mm -hmm. yeah and i can't wait until you can we can all sort of get back in and do some more work in the collection oh, I'm, I'm definitely leaving with a couple of your um Fijian clubs when I go and visit, <laughs> I like stuff them. I'm gonna bring a big coat. I'm just right, gonna just, like exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like but show me, show me, like hang out with them here and just walk around with them. Show me like, OC 14 right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, they're pretty oh. amazing. Very formidable. <laughs> yeah. It's Part yeah, of the question definitely. that we haven't done as much programming around. And so we're really excited to try and branch out a little bit more with our programming to other areas of the collection. So we really appreciate you taking the time today Most and hopefully ongoing. It's, I hope it's just the beginning of a conversation that can continue to expand. Most definitely. And, you know, like, it's like, thank you very much. It was like a huge honor and privilege to be able to like do this. Um, I, I mean, the fact that there's, uh, you're, I mean, I want that whole collection. You know, <laughs> like when you sent me that PDF, I was like, want that, want that, want that. It's all here in the high desert. I'm like, they're so far from home. Like, I need to go and visit them. You know what I mean? They, so, they need um, that. They yeah, need some you know. yeah. And that's why we're here. You know, that's, you know, really why we're here. So, and I'll bring my cocoa nut oil. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but no cookies, no cookies. <laughs> no, no outstanding cookies for sure. You know, no, we're no, going to no. be really so, suspicious now. Like, you yeah. want some chocolate chip cookies? You want some, mac <laughs> mac you want some macadamia nut cookies? Oh, that's just mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, no, okay, from this point on out, everybody that's watching this never accept any baked goods from me ever, you know? <laughs> um, my partner, though, is an amazing baker and amazing at cooking in general. If they ever have anything and they offer to you, I recommend eating it. Um, but yeah, definitely not for me. 
<laughs> one lesson away from the day. It's don't accept baked goods. One them. lesson. You don't need to know about like star navigation. You don't need to know about how like when they do this, you know, nowadays that it, it's not an ancient technique. Uh, just don't eat my baked goods. All right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I guess that's probably a really excellent note to end on maybe. Yeah, <laughs>